Thinking the exhibition, curating as a verb. The Art World's museums, secondary market, and biennial system constitute a global financial machine, one in which traditional curators are embedded as gatekeepers. What then might a different curatorial practice entail, one that challenged such market-driven boundaries as margin and center? With recourse to Hannah Arendt's notion of thinking, curation would then shift from being a profession to an action. This talk provides three case historical studies that influenced a like-minded exhibition recently mounted at the American University of Beirut. I'll begin with Jean-Francois Lyotard's ominous postulate made in regard to his 1985 exhibition, Les Immaterial. That we know not how to name what awaits us is the sure sign that it awaits us. I invoke this temporal dilemma to frame my thesis today that cultural gatekeeping entails historical gatekeeping. What does this mean? Simply that what we collectively remember is always politically motivated, especially when that memory is unconscious. On this note, I will conclude today with a case study exhibition I co-curated at the American University of Beirut, which addressed just that. The historical caesura that lies at the heart of Lebanon's collective memory of their recent civil war. That exhibition was intended as a site-specific intervention, but also as a more general trespassing of the curatorial gate currently maintained by those conventional practitioners who elect to be handmaids of their given institution's role in maintaining their state ideology. In this way, the curatorial gatekeeper would be akin to what Freud called the cognitive preconscious system, that psychic agency tasked with screening unconscious thoughts, allowing repressed memories to surface only by way of altering or adjusting them into a form that is acceptable to our, to our consciousness. Whereas memories that are deemed inappropriate to our well-being, ones contradicting our conventional sense of self, are repressed. But there's a second branch of curators, ones I'll call the trespassers, to which Jean-Francois Lyotard belonged when he transgressed the Pompidou's gates in 1985 and to whom our exhibition at AUB was dedicated. What beats at the heart of such trespassers is a hermeneutic impulse. As an overture, then, I should mention that three publications have influenced my imperative of thinking as the quintessential modality of curating as a verb. I'll address them briefly here, followed by three historical case studies of curatorial thinking, concluding with the case study exhibition at the American University of Beirut. First, there's my recent book, The Hermeneutic Impulse, Aesthetics of an Untethered Past, which performatively theorized a hermeneutic model of curatorial artistic collaboration. The case study artworks featured in this book relied on Hannah Arendt's postulate by way of Faulkner, that the past isn't dead in that it hasn't passed at all. Rather, the past lives in the present where it is veiled, I might add. I argued in this book that we need to work through this temporal aporia because the effect of repressing the past as past is to facilitate repetition compulsion, that of the worst sort within the present. We see this everywhere today, most horrifically in the return of global authoritarianism, facilita facilitated by those handmade gatekeepers of culture, from media, technology, reportage, and yes, art and curation. Second, there's Walid Sadek's, Sadek's special issue of Third Text magazine, Not Not Arab, which addressed Lebanon's crisis of living within a protracted sense of now, a temporality perpetuated by conflicting ideologies from state actors to Hezbollah insurgents to artists and curators alike. I should add, of course, that Walid Sadek is talking about a Lebanese um, cultural landscape. Sadek proposes the production of critical chronotopes in art and theory as a transgressive alternative. In his intro to this volume, he asserts, quote, there lies in the double negative, not not Arab, a disinclination to side with either of the two reductive poles 
of identities machinations, the Arab or the not Arab. This double negation, in turn, is the not-not name we may then give to the possibility of a critical chronotope, with which we seek to regain the representability of events against the policed ontological order that only finds its awkward balance in sundering time from place." Unquote. By extension, then, the not-not now entails a not-not then, which means our consciousness is neither solely then or now, but allegorically, as Walter Benjamin has argued, a combination of the two. Thirdly, and most significantly to my book anyway, there's the Heidelberg Conference book, or Heidegger Philosophy and Politics, the Heidelberg Confer Conference, published in 2016, that documented a conference that took place on February 5, 1988, when two philosophers, Hans-Georg Gadamer and Jacques Derrida, convened at the University of Heidelberg in Lecture Hall 13 of the Neue Aula. It was one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall and seven years after the two philosophers had rendezvoused on a different stage in Paris to debate their indebtedness to Heidegger's notion of being. But on that particular night, on February 5th, in Heidelberg, they met to discuss the primal scene haunting the very amphitheater in which they sat. Heidegger's delivery of his 1933 speech, The University and the Third Reich, delivered in his capacity of rector at the University of Freiburg and while he was a member of the Nazi party. As a means of working through the ill deeds of their paternal figure, Derrida and Gadamir were asked to address how Heidegger's thought might causally be connected to his atrocious political affiliation. Spanning several days, the conversation was improvis improvisational, at times even polemical, producing a kind of surplus value to the event. The question became, how can we be in time with historical events as they return? Gadamer asked. How could we ever be in time with historical events given their meanings endless deferral? Derrida countered. For Gadamer, our communal relation to the past is never absolute, but the caesura between the then and the now of historical events can be hinged through poetic experience. While for Derrida, on the other hand, we can never pick up where someone else left off. Any sense of our communing with, the, with a past event, poetic or otherwise, only represses the paradox of our being in language. Having said that, I would add, what if both impulses, one to commune, the other to disrupt, were at work in our conscious, unconscious experience of the past? All this talk of hermeneutics brings us back to our imperative at hand, thinking the exhibition as a means of curating as a verb. I'd like to read uh, from the PowerPoint the citation by Hannah Arendt, made in 1971. It is in the thinker's nature to undo, unfreeze, as it were, what language, the medium of thinking, has frozen into thought. These frozen thoughts, Socrates seems to say, became uh, become so handy you can use them in your sleep. But if the wind of thinking, which I shall now arouse in you, has aroused you from your sleep and made you fully awake and alive, then you will see that you have nothing in your hand but perplexities, and the most we can do with them is share them with each other. Arendt was adamant that there could be no... Excuse me... Adamant, uh, Arendt was adamant that there could be no ready-made template for knowledge, neither a universal aesthetic form nor a philosophical method, only a different critical tactic by which we would think or unknow all epistemological strategies. For Arendt, thinking was therefore a rinse-and-repeat activity. Having unthought one hegemony, naturally entails the return of that same hegemony in a different form. In this way, you really have to keep on top of it. In short, thinking is a full-time occupation without formative rules, templates, or master plans. 
Accordingly, to be a true thinker entails rethinking all your findings the day after you have just found them. What follows now are three historical case studies of curating as a verb in which thinking is a given kind of non-binary trespassing by the not-not curator. Accordingly, each exhibition gives us a hermeneutic tactic for, trans, uh, for trespassing uh, gatekeepers. And I would just say in advance that these tactics uh, of, of, of the three case studies would be chance or the return of the repressed by Duchamp, the sublime of, uh, or neoliberal embeddedness put forth by Lyotard, and empire um, or the deterritorialization thereof by the late, recently late curator Okui. We should note, however, that the tactics of these historical trespassers are almost always immediately co-opted by those same gatekeepers uh, as the canon's new strategy. We therefore must focus on the contextual nature of their critical intervention rather than fetishize their interventional tactics themselves. So first I'll begin with Marcel Duchamp's second annual exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists from 1917. And I would refer to him as a, uh, as a practitioner artist curator. The Society of Independent Artists was born in 1916 when Duchamp, along with his cohorts, conceived an American exhibition platform much in the likes of the Parisian Independent Salon, which had launched a branch of French avant-garde painting. In alliance, Duchamp and company decided that the board of directors would be bound by the Society's founding constitution to accept all members' submissions for exhibitions mounted without jury or prizes giving the right to anyone to exhibit upon payment of a modest fee. Duchamp was selected to organize the Society's 1917 annual exhibition in New York. Hence the legendary ready-made fountain, surreptitiously entered by Duchamp under the pseudonym R. Mutt and photographed by, photographed by Alfred Stieglitz, the scandalous rejection of which was chronicled at the time in the journal The Blind Man. This story is legendary, but I want to redirect us to his curatorial method, which, if not repressed, is often overlooked. We should recall that Duchamp had been rejected by the non-juried Salon des Independents in 1912 when they refused to include his new descending a staircase number two in their annual exhibition. From the start, then, Duchamp had a bone to pick. Leaving Paris behind, Duchamp moved to America in 1915, shifting his practice towards an aesthetics of chance, hence his three standard stoppages, there on the left. The operation of this artwork was simple. Three threads, each measuring one meter, one held and held horizontally, horizontally, were dropped from the height of one meter onto a piece of canvas where it was fixed and positioned there by varnish. <coughs> Favoring contingency over perspective in this way, Duchamp escaped traditional methods of expression, privileging neither the likeness and truth that characterized all brands of realism at the time, nor beauty, harmony, or balance as in aesthetics of formalism. Art historian Herbert Molderings uh, calls this an aesthetic of the possible. While I concur with Moldering, I would add that Duchamp's chasing the possible logically entailed his negating the conventional ideas of what was impossible, that is, what polite society censored. Inducing, instead, a series of ready-made chance operations and aesthetics of chance extending from his art to his exhibition production, Duchamp was thus in pursuit of what had yet to be, instancing yet another modality of thinking beyond established knowledge or artistic norms. Hence Duchamp's installation plan, which has received much less attention, as I said, one that reflected his own aesthetic practice. In his curatorial hands, even the alphabet, a purposeful ready-made, is displaced towards chance. I'll cite from the MIT Press monograph, which documents his life works by astrological chart. So, on April 6, 1917, quote, 
Having been elected head of the hanging committee of the exhibition, Duchamp is faced with the task of installing 2,500 works in three days. To, invo to avoid any preconceived idea of grouping, Duchamp's suggestion, uh, 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 sorry, Duchamp's suggestion, suggestion was that a democratic formula would be imposed on the arrangement of the show uh, 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 and that that would be the adopted methodology. The works will be hung commencing in the northeast corner of the main gallery in the Grand Central Palace according to the artist's surname in alphabetical order. In the morning, at the exhibition hall, witnessed by Rocher and Beatrice Wood, the letter R is drawn from a hat, which determines for Marcel the works to be hung first. And so the rest, as they say, is history. So for this case study, I would say the trespassed gate is the notion of a not-not juried show. And the hermeneutic tactic would be the ready-made on a beam through the strategy of chance operations. The second case study would be Jean-Francois Lyotard and Thierry Chapu's Les Immateriaux um, at the Pompidou Center in 1985. And I would say that this would instance the practitioner as a philosopher curator. In 1985, Having completed his now legendary treatise, The Postmodern Condition, A Report on Knowledge, Leotard set out to demonstrate this condition performatively, specifically how postmodernity, a labyrinth of forgotten modernities, persists under so-called late-stage capitalism with its multinational corporations, globalized markets and labor, mass consumption, and liquid multinational flows of capital. As opposed to Frederick Jameson, uh, I would say Leotard's uh, rhetorical other, Leotard believed that this sublime condition could not be mapped cognitively. Rather, it would be truer to display capitalism as the aporia that it is, one which we can't hold in our mind from any single Archimedean point with, yeah, with any sort of clarity. Accordingly, we have Leotard's installation. Drawing upon a modernist metaphor, Borges' world as an infinite library, he transformed the Pompidou's fifth floor into a massive metallic maze, divided by gray gauze screens into 61 zones that, in turn, were arranged consecutively along five adjacent pathways. Each zone consisted of small installations of various cultural artifacts, technological representations, and electronic devices, which were then titled by the ideas or conditions they were intended to represent or demonstrate. Upon entering, the viewer was instructed to put on headphones and listen to cassettes coordinated to, vari to the various zones, which played a montage of French theory from Blanchot, Baudrillard, Bart and modern writing from Beckett, Artaud, Mallarmé, Proust, and Zola, among others. As philosopher Jean Reichmann noted at the time, there were video, film slides and photographs, commercial and artistic, anonymous and signed, old and recent. There were robots, an elaborate photocopier, the display of a holographic movie, and of course computers, lots of them. At the cost of eight million francs, at the time, the most expensive contemporary art exhibition ever, Les Materiaux was at once implicated by and detached from the capitalist framework, with, which was its subject. It was part of it in that the Pompidou's financial infrastructure, one ordinarily repressed from view by standard muse museological strategies, is very much bound up with Wall Street through, uh, through the secondary market. It was attached from it in that this very market was the exhibition's critique. Hence the embodied sublime edge of Les Materiaux. In 1985, the eve of that sea-changing moment we simply call 1989, that still lay at that time on the horizon. Hence Leotard, that we know not how to name what awaits us, is the sure sign that it awaits us. The gate here transgressed is the not-not capitalism, and the tactic, hermeneutically, would be the labyrinth, atemporality, postmodernity, 
all of which are the repressed modernities within that contemporary mise-en-scene. And finally, the third historical case study, Okwi Anwizor's Documenta 11 from 2002. And in this case, we have uh, a practitioner as the post-colonial curator. Documenta 11's discursive formation was Tony Negri's Empire, which had just been published, and Deleuze, Guattar and, Deleuze and Guattari's notion of deterritorialization de in the context of the vast global change post-1989, to which the list of historical events on the left here attest. And you can see, you know, at this moment, uh, you know, the, the EU had just expanded, and we are still actually the events of today. You can see this is a bit of a primal scene in 2002. Deterritorialization is the French psychoanalytic term that refers, refers to the fluid, dissipated, and schizophrenic nature of human subjectivity in contemporary capitalist culture. More commonly, it refers to global, uh, cultural globalization. Deleuze and Guattari further defined it as a movement by which one leaves a territory, all the while constituting and extending the territory itself. Negre's empire was highly reliant on Deleuze's principle, whereby nation-state empires of the 19th century have been supplanted by a network of international capitalist corporations and black market oligarchies, which, you know, again, is very contemporary. The question for Okwi then was how to set out a radical agenda within an art network that in conjunction with the re-territorializing re imperatives of globalization is always already being packaged with the neoliberal and invariably empty wrapping of multicultural inclusiveness, as the art critic Anthony Downey asked at the time. Okwi's proposition was to stage an extraterritorial documenta, as he put it, Art exceeds the borders of the former colonized world to lay claim to the modernized metropolitan world of empire by making empire's former other visible and present at all times, either through the media or through mediate, uh, mediatory, spectatorial, and carnivalesque relations of language, communication, images, contact, and resistance within the everyday. So this was his problematic, how to not re-spectacularize the margin that has moved towards the center when you are curating from that said center. In this way, the canon's perennial debate concerning art, autonomy, and politics had thus reached its limit. Autonomous art objects were now deficient when it comes to exploring social interaction and generating uh, commitment in the form of ethical and political responsibility, but so too was the swing towards Marxist politics, which couldn't illustrate the apart shift whereby center and margin had merged or collapsed it will within this new empire. Consequently, both formalist art and left politics needed to be undone, but they needed to be undone together as an imbrication. Okwi's task then was to performatively illustrate how marginalized people, not just artworks, were embedded within the new global center. In this way, Okwi extended Negri's notion of empire to the art world's social, fiscal, and political economies. Following Negri even further, the game Okwi set out to play as curator was about putting, I'm sorry, it was about pitting capitalism against itself rather than idealistically negating it. We should note that 70% of artworks in uh, Documenta 11 uh, were original commissions to meet the criteria of this idea specifically. Hence the exhibition's five intercontinental transdisciplinary platforms that decentered Europe and recentered its former colonies. It began a year before the final platform in Kozel opened, and, the, and it, so it spanned 18 months, and you can see from that list along the way that 9-11 would have happened in the midst. So the gate trans transgressed here would be the not-not margin, how to be on the margin within the center, not as the marginalized, but to decenter the center, as it were. And the tactic hermeneutically to do this were exterritoriality, displacement, and expansion. 
we finally arrive at our concluding case study, which took place in Beirut's AUB, as I mentioned. Um, here is AUB. Uh, you see it's right there on the Mediterranean. On the Google map on the right, you'll see it's located in Hamra, which is west uh, Beirut, not the more gentrified east Beirut. And that's its uh, main hall as you come through the gates. The exhibition there was called Cezura, a moment in time, again, rubbed smooth. And this was curated by a, a group of student curators, graduated, uh, I'm sorry, graduate students and undergrad, uh, with me as a coach and a co-curator, not as a uh, professor that would censor or um, grade them along the way, which is to say I set out a number of criteria that they had to meet and so that they could derive, very much like psychoanalysis, their own solution for their exhibition proposal. But I did set out to give them the criteria from which to work in the beginning, which I'll discuss now. So this um, exhibition was the result, therefore, of a curatorial theory as practice two-part seminar the first was curating as a verb. It was taught in fall, um, and it was the history of curating. And the hermeneutic impulse, it was taught in spring, and it was the theory and practice of curating. The curating as a verb seminar covered an extended survey of case studies, three of which I just presented here. And the hermeneutic impulse seminar theorized collections, archives, and exhibitions as cultural vehicles to either gatekeep the past as forgotten or as a dreamscape, whereupon the repressed returns despite the cur curator's intentions. And on this note, um, we have the permanent collection exhibition, which was installed at the time within the entire um, gallery in the entire academic year. I was a professor there and teaching these seminars at AUB. And I should say it was a quintessential gatekeeping exhibition. Um, and we can see from reading a few lines of it from the brochure, uh, the first known attempts to establish a permanent collection at AUB came in the early 1970s. Several key works, including Farid Haddad's Untitled 1971, Helene Kalal's Jacob's Ladder of 1969, and Jean Khalifa's the Singing American 1971, came together in 1971 as part of an initiative to establish the permanent collection of contemporary art at the American University of Beirut. And uh, uh, paraphrasing this, what happened midway though in 71, as you can see in 75 and 76, the Civil War happened, so that collection uh, never comes to be. Um, but the second attempt is uh, to establish a permanent collection one which the gallery is now has to show every year um, and they have to gatekeep and domicile that collection um, was uh, came came long after the war in 2011 and um, by Dr. Samir Salibi who donated a number of paintings by the early Lebanese artists including Khalil Salibi and that it is a small collection as I said which the university is tasked with uh, curating annually. And so the curator, resident curator there, um, is actually not only tasked with showing this, but showing it every year and trying to reinvent the same 60 to 70 paintings, um, which is quite a task because they're primarily portraits of Salibi and his wife and other people. So, um, as a, and here is what the exhibition looks like. On the left, you'll see where it is purple. That is the first uh, reproductions, as well as two paintings from the first attempt to make a modernist collection. And then uh, that ends in, uh, in 75, when one of those paintings, the blue one there, or the square, was damaged in the uh, protests at AUB in 1975. And then on the right, in the orange section, you'll see uh, 
selections from the Salibi uh, artists' um, portfolio. So as a group, we set out to read this exhibition as a dreamscape, um, which, as a screen memory, consciously repressed um, uh, Lebanon's complex history of modernity, neoliberalism, and the Civil War. Although, just like in a dream, this subject was unconsciously, meaning the Civil War, present by way of the curator selection and presentation process. So, um, so here's just more installation shots of that permanent. These are important. Um, that line there is the line of the color line that I uh, focus in, zoom in on is the distinction between the first collection from the 70s. And so that line comes to be uh, 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 the Civil War itself that's not here. Because then uh, the paintings that are in orange, even though on the orange wall, even though they are from the, you know, the, the early 20th century, they come into collection at AUB in 2011 uh, after the reconstruction of Lebanon and after sort of the state history of the Civil War has uh, been repressed. So um, here's another. So, and you see there in the painting, uh, that, that, that gray mark, that's, that's damage from the protest when the campus was overrun with protest in 1974 on the eve of the Civil War. And then there was more uh, other uh, various uh, reproductions and documentations in a white section that really looks at the architecture, uh, sort of highlights, therefore, because it's white, the architecture of the gallery. So our response then um, was the following, and I, uh, in conclusion, will read from um, the brochure, uh, and so that you can understand, uh, and I'll show you the pictures again of the vitrines, um, what we did. All permanent collections are a paradox. This is our group statement. For the historian's desire to conserve the past through collection of artworks, archives, and documents is to replace the past by way of narrativizing those historical events from which such artifacts originate. Again, rubbed smooth, a moment in time, Caesura addresses this quagmire by taking AUB's current exhibition, the permanent collection, as its subject. In so doing, the curatorial team first read the permanent collection as a dreamscape, whereupon the exhibition's various manifest signifiers, paintings, wall color, supplemental didactics, and framing architecture, were identified and analyzed. Secondly, the team asked, what did these elements signify beneath the exhibition's curatorial intent and beyond the art historical account given to artworks by Khalil Salibi, uh, Saliba Dahouli, Omar Onsi, Mustafa Farouk, and Cesar Gamayel that are domiciled in AOB's permanent collection? In the course of our reading, three latent historical events within the permanent collection's manifest narrative uh, narrative structure reemerged: The Lebanese Civil War from 1975 to 1990, AUB's student uprising from 1967 to 1975, and the famed milk bar, which today is the AUB gallery. The curatorial team then endeavored to displace this latent historical content to the outside vitrines wrapping the gallery's exterior walls like a membrane, one that porously delineates the so-called exterior world of materialist history from the interior space of aestheticized memory. In so doing, what again rubbed smooth a moment in time Caesura attempts to enact as a supplemental exhibition to the permanent collection is the return of the historical repressed within the aesthetic meta-narrative that defines the permanent collection's institutional housing and annual exhibition. So we can return then. These were the three vitrines and their title. Uh, uh, I would constantly give them riddles to solve rather than say that what they should do. So I said, you know, your title should probably be in three parts and it should denote some sort of conceptual action of the three moments that we just talked about, the, the Civil War, the Milk Bar, um, and sort of um, uh, the student uprising. 
Um, so the first on the right is uh, uh, an image dedicated to the Civil War. And under that, they thought of the Civil War as a palimpsest. History is just this archeological dig where one screen memory uh, uh, was, was placed upon another. And so Arabic, reading from right to left, that is again rubbed smooth, which is the Greek literal translation for palimpsest because there is no Arabic translation. In, uh, directly. And then the second part of the title is a moment in time, which means history. So you have a cinematic, nostalgic image of the milk bar, of, of, of the woman with her male cohorts in the bar. And then the third is uh, two anecdotes by uh, uh, students uh, reflecting on the student revolt from 1975. <laughs> and that is Caesura. And so they came up with a three-part poetic caption to these historical moments that would that were latent in the exhibition that would come out and not negate the show, but the places in that exhibition that they would find, for instance, the color schema of that line you saw up here, this line delineating the modern from uh, the modern pre-Civil War to the orange you know, moment that we're really in now, post-war reconstruction, was the color scheme for a palimpsestic image denoting the Civil War there. And the others had like-minded a relationship to certain signifiers within the exhibition. Um, and we can, yeah, focus on that one uh, in terms of palimpsest. And then what was interesting as well, um, as one of the best groups I've worked with, um, that they had to have the title be able to read uh, almost as a conceptual palindrome, not literally because you want to read from Arabic right to left, but that you could read the title left to right in English, which is the way it was published in the brochure. So in English, it's Caesura, a moment in time again rubbed smooth, starting from left to right. Um, whereas in Arabic, the title is again rubbed smooth, a moment in time, Caesura, looping the present into the past, the English into the Arabic, the Western into the East. And so you can see that from um, chance, we get the dreamscape of Duchamp, right? Um, from Leotard, we get the global capitalist system from which we can't detach ourselves, And from Oakley, we got the movement of margin to center and back again. So all of this went towards the aparia of memory. And so the gate we transgressed, and at least we intended to, was the not, not memory. And the tactic for which to do so was the not, not now. To conclude then, I would like to evoke Jean-Paul Sartre's small volume situations. When, uh, when we consider who mans those cultural gates today, and in turn, who might then our fellow trespassers be, because they're all around us. As a teacher, writer, and curator, these are the questions I ask myself when I commit to thinking the task a rent begs us to undertake. Thank you so much.